Welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self Liberator's Paradise. Uh, that website is Pasnia, P A Z N I A dot com. Uh, if you'd like to learn all about the Second Realm Network uh, that we're building. On that note, the first event of uh, year two here at Pasnia has been announced uh, with the coming of warm weather. April, March 31st to April 4th. Again, March 31st uh, to April 4th marks our now annual spring camping event at our Church of Self-Liberation, uh, the Nature Sanctuary here at the Free Republic. Uh, all vetted Pasnians and self-liberators are encouraged to attend. Uh, the only items on the docket uh, thus far are uh, lamb, bird, lamb and bird processing and uh, probably cleaning out a shed here on the property as uh, we transition the ruminants over to the other larger field. And uh, as always on the docket, a reinvigorating weekend getaway of liberation here at the Free Republic of Pasnia. Again, the website is pasnia.com uh, if you need help getting vetted or uh, wish to learn more. Again, uh, so yeah, anyway, today I'm joined by uh, Brian Sovereign, host of the Sovereign Tech podcast, uh, author of the book on uh, Dark Android, and uh, one of the panel members uh, in the 200, 200 episode special uh, roundtable podcast uh, that was uh, TVP number 127. Uh, if you'd like to scroll back through your podcatcher uh, after today's discussion, of course. Uh, he was also a guest very early on in our Crypto Anarchism series, episode number 47, dating back to June of 2018, uh, which in many respects feels like an entirely different fucking life. Um, but to give you an idea of our discussion then, uh, that show was titled Mesh Networking Applications for Self-Liberators. Uh, so today I figure we'll start with an update on Sovereign Tech and uh, the state of the overall tech world. Uh, talk a bit more about his uh, upcoming Van Nomad adventure, since that's definitely... Uh, very pertinent to this podcast and even the Free Republic of Pasnia too. Uh, we'll get a 2022 Dark Android update, especially now with my experience with the Ghost Phone, because last time we talked about it, I had never had anything but a Spy Phone. So um, I actually have you know a month or so under my belt of uh, of uh, the Ghost Phone. So that'll be a, a lot of fun to talk to them about that. And uh, we'll probably spend the rest of the time talking about new projects, uh, ideas, and uh, more generally. Uh, as per the title of this episode, uh, ways to further fortify the digital second realm, which of course translates into physical space time too. But um, without further ado, Brian, uh, welcome back to the Vani podcast, man. Uh, how are things going? Good, good. Honored, uh, honored to be back. And you know, I don't know if I got the chance to say it last time I was on, but 200 episodes, and and you're just rocking. But <laughs> I mean, bravo. <laughs> so uh, yeah, again, great to be back. Um, with, uh, you know, Sovereign Tech, um, we're celebrating around 400 episodes, you know, not that like we're in any kind of competition. I just love it knowing that there are podcasts that are playing the long game um, because this kind of media is so important. Um, I will admit, like there was a, probably a couple of years ago, this was before the the, the thing uh, the thing known as, 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 as COOF or COVID, mm -hmm. depending on how you want to say it. Um, that like there was a part of me that that was thinking it's like well you know we're at where we're at with tech and you know i don't know and i i know this is kind of a general gist of what we're going to talk about um but i was feeling very disillusioned um with the direction that tech was going because kind of like you're talking about with the ghost phone which biconic's doing great work on that stuff I, I mean i absolutely love what he has going on um but I, you know, it, like things you, you just, and I know we talked about this during episode, your, your 200th uh, episode as well. Like you just can't pull anything off the shelf anymore and, and really have any kind of expectation, not only of privacy, but also of security. And so things at the time, I want to say, you know, in 2019, I was kind of feeling like, well, you know, has this run its course? Like, is the message just like lost? The tech war is lost. It's over. Um, and so I was, I was kind of thinking of, 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 you know, sovereign tech kind of dropping off of the map, but really then, you know, COVID did occur and it's, it, it came pretty apparent that, oh no, we've, you know, <laughs> podcasts, liberty oriented podcasts need to keep going and need to be out there, uh, you know, to help get either a, some truth or some actionable, you know, solutions, items uh, out there for people, you know, during that time. Um, not that I feel any better uh, about the direction that that tech is going. And really, I feel like we've essentially, at least in America, we've essentially lost control of like even our options on tech, um, the direction that things are going. Like, like the market cannot speak right now. 
I mean, I mean, they're, you know, it's, it's essentially, you know, it's Samsung, it's Google, it's Apple, it's whoever, you know, offering crap sandwich A and crap sandwich B, you know, that that's, those are, those are your choices. Um, so, you know, it's definitely a time for a lot of independent work to be done. And like you're talking about the ghost phone, certainly that's part of that. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into some other things, but, uh, yeah, so sovereign tech has definitely taken a turn towards, okay, here's, you know, the best of what to use now. There's not a whole lot, in my opinion, there's not a whole lot of point in, I mean, something I used to do a lot would be covering, okay, what are the, what are the tech giants doing today? You know, and you can still get into that. It's still important to get that information out there. Um, but really, you know, what they're doing, you have no say in which direction they want things to go. Um, and in a lot of cases, you don't even really have like, again, like I was saying earlier, you don't have a choice on what technology uh, you want to even take advantage of. For for example, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, later too, uh, like my, the smartphone I have right now is a spy phone, as you so aptly called them. Um, it's a, it's a Google Pixel 6. Now, when I first got this, this is a totally new phone. When I first got this in November of 2021, um, I could set it to where it would just use 4G. As of its most recent update, now you essentially are forced with the stock software to use 5G. They don't even give you the option anymore, even though all the radios are there and everything's there for you to take advantage of 4G. And for months I did, I had it set for that. And for good reasons, I mean, don't even have to get into health concerns around 5G. It's just a matter of saving battery and all these other things. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the thing or that, that kind of just elucidates the point is that you are losing so much control. Now, I mean, I can reinstall, you know, a different uh, ROM, you know, or operating system onto that phone, and that's likely going to happen. Um, but just to prove the point that off the shelf, you just don't have control, you know, the technology that you're using. And so a lot of sovereign techs take in the past year, year and a half has been around concentrating on technologies where you absolutely do have control and stepping far more out of the consumer space, which is what I think made the show popular for many years. Um, but again, that, that consumer space is just essentially lost and just, you know, the best suggestion is to just walk away from that. But yeah, so that, I guess that's a, that's a, a somewhat short version of, of where Sovereign Tech is at right now. Sure. And I, I, I appreciate that. And that's that's kind of um, the what I've noticed, especially over the past couple of years with, I guess, I, I've doubled down on research into like health and a lot of other subjects, too. But you can't really use mm -hmm. speaking in, in, in that same sort of um, speaking towards that same thing. You can't really do a lot of research on the Internet anymore, like with with search engines. It's just gotten a lot harder. So you're talking about right. the importance of Liberty podcasts and podcasts in general. I mean, that's a really hard um, avenue to censor, right? Like, um, I, RSS yeah. feeds. So like, I think it's critically important. Um, the podcasting in general, I, I had Daryl Becker on back in 20, I guess it would have been like mid 2020 when, uh, um, I guess, uh, Google was entering into the pharmaceutical space and, uh, they were, you know, obviously yeah. doing their dis. they were, you know, obviously any, any narratives outside of what they, of what they want to promote monetarily for financial reasons or otherwise mm -hmm. are off the platform. So I, I kind of had the, the realization with him or I was kind of talking through it at that point. Like if regardless of what the truth is, you know, like the regardless of what the truth is, like the only thing that's going to be available to like most of the mainstream, you know, main, the, the mainstream folks is going to be like one thing. Um, so yeah, like I think keeping, mm -hmm. um, keeping, you know, whether it's, you know, the truth or the Liberty stuff out there is great. And then you, as you're talking about with the tech, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny, um, you know, like the, the de-Googled Google Pixel um, is like what, the, what you have to work yeah. with now. So like there's not, yeah, there's, there's definitely not a, lot, a lot, not a whole lot of options in the tech. I mean, everything is going towards kind of that homogenous, that homogenization where everyone has, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the same thing. So um, I, I, I definitely, definitely share that sentiment. And, uh, you know, despite, um, you know, despite, you know, your, your kind of negative outlook, and I, and I, I understand I'm right there with you. I, I started 2020, I kind of, you know, took a little tech sabbatical and I was going maybe back into the primitive areas too. Like I kind of had a, a visceral reaction. Sure. But so I'm back into it now, obviously. But I, I, took, I took a step back because um, it just kind of seemed like the, the digital realm, the tech world was kind of, was kind of uh, uh, lost. But um, the, on a more optimistic stance, um, I'm very pleased, you know, after taking a step back for a while, I did, I tried out, you know, like Jitsi, we're on Jitsi right now. I tried out their, um, their app back in 2015 and it required like a bunch of manual steps to get things going. And, and, uh, a lot of the stuff that I was trying out then was super, like it was task. Like it was something I had to like want to do to like practice or, you know, to like, to, to, to experiment. But, uh, thankfully, you know, now, like it mm -hmm. seems like the open source space has progressed a lot. Um, so much to the point that we're talking about the ghost phones. 
I have, uh, you know, like little experience with, well, actually zero experience with Android and uh, zero and very little experience with Linux outside of, um, I guess, uh, Linux Tails bootable flash drive and um, also the, the ghost pad that's uh, right. one of Jamin's ghost pads that I have. Um, but, you know, like you pick up this, this uh, the ghost phone with Calyx OS on it, it's just going to work. Like, it's crazy. Um, no, no issues yeah. so far. The, the freedom beyond like the Apple, I, the Apple App Store is amazing. Um, the fact that it tells you, like, before you download anything, it tells you, like, any privacy concerns that are with the app. Um, like, all that, it's, 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 it's incredible. Um, it's, it's definitely incredible. And uh, um, to have all of, my, all of my network traffic routed through um, VPN and Tor is just, just, just incredible. And it doesn't take any setup. It just, it's always on. Just You set it up that way, and it's always on. Um, so, yes. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly. And, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, man. Oh, um, so, yeah, certainly something that occurred. Uh, you know, since actually the last, the last, last time I was on Banu podcast, um, I mean, in fact, interestingly, it was my, it was Sovereign Tech's episode 200. So this is a, you know, a few years ago, um, where I essentially declared like, look, open source has won. Like it's over closed source is effectively dead. Like, yeah, there's people who are still going to, you know, uh, develop within that kind of, um, you know, mentality, but open source has really won the day. And it still has. And that that's like the one really hopeful aspect with, with tech. Um, the thing is, it's it hasn't won because people necessarily have like this ethos of, yes, I want everything to be open source so I can check my own code. It more won because the system, the legacy system, like needs it. It has to operate at that scale. It has to operate where so many people can, can contribute to it. Like, I mean, it's just a necessity, which is still ultimately a good thing. Um, but you know, the issue, so open source has one, but the issue is, and things are getting better, kind of like ghost phone, like you're talking about, uh, is there's a bit of a learning curve, you know, to using certain open source software. Some things mm -hmm. it's, you know, easy as pie to take advantage of. Um, but that, that learning curve, you know, is still kind of there, but even that I think we're closing in on a bit. Uh, and really it just comes down to more to, you know, people just, got to learn to get off of Facebook, you know, or, or get off of, you know, what, whatever, uh, I don't know, whatever network, you know, that, that they're thinking of, but that, that, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, and, uh, I guess the, um, yeah. And, and I guess there, there's kind of the necessity aspect too. Like it, it does kind of require the, uh, yeah, the the ease the the user friendliness is a is is a is a great first step, and then mm -hmm. I I don't know for me it was kind of um I've been taking I've been taking steps out of the first realm um Serval society for for a number of years, and five years ago it would have been pointless for me to try to um like that I I really didn't have that much privacy or privacy back then, and I knew if I was using a spy phone I knew what was sure. I knew there was no privacy there, but uh um I was going to I was gonna just go without a without a spy phone and then Jamin came out with these or just go without a smartphone in general for for some time but he came out with these ghost phones mm -hmm. and I got one that was you know it's my it's my my ghost phone there's no no Google services on there no nothing obviously um, right. and I, I had this 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 new idea like I, I have to keep I have a phone number associated with telegram and also signal and you know other ones which unfortunately that's just that's gonna be mm -hmm. that's gonna be with me now um and I was just gonna keep like a shitty old I iPhone like just the number in use just for that for that sake and i was you know i had the thought like if i'm gonna have if i have to have one of these effing things with me like it might as well be the most secure thing that i have that i possibly could have right um yeah. so i got I, I got i got a second yeah, one absolutely so i've got my, my my black phone and my white phone and uh the white phone one like you know i still yeah. like to get on twitter like i'm sorry like if i'm out and about i like to get on twitter um <laughs> It's my. It's the only. It's the only like I guess uh, centralized social media I'm on now. But um, like I'm obviously not going to install that sure. on, my, on my on my ghost phone. But um, regardless, yeah. Um, regardless, um, yeah. It it, it takes uh, you know the user friendliness was a great step, and then really it's just got to. Um, I think. Yeah, for me it was more so just trying trying to bring all of my actions in line with my principles, and obviously being on coercive platforms is not in line with my principles. So um, it kind of took that that little yeah. that little push too. Um, but you know, I, I I sell some of these I sell these ghost phones for Jamin on the LUA site, and there's a demand for them now. Um, there's definitely I, there's there's definitely an increased right. demand in in these things now. So I think it's no no better time. Yeah, you know what else is, and, and I'm glad you you brought this up. Um, so something or where there is a sea change, where there is a mentality change and a good one, because um, it was something that I've been purporting for ever. Um, 
And that is like Telegram you mentioned. Um, I mean, people can, you know, bring up their arguments around its encryption scheme and all that and whatever, you know, that that's at this point, it's inconsequential, but or at least for the argument, it's inconsequential. Um, the thing I love about it is last year, you know, Telegram finally came out and said, hey, you know, if you get our app from either the iOS app store or the Google Play store, like they're they're censoring what you can see. And so we'll make a version available that you can download on Android, you know, uh, you know, for free, because it's always been for free. Um, but you can download it. You can download it independently. It won't run into that censorship issue. And we're actually going to give you like advanced features um, if you use the independent APK, if you use the independent installer. Oh, wow. And I just thought, wow, I mean, like the, getting away from app stores, because there's where you just I mean, in how many apps, especially social media apps for whatever group, whether you agree with them or not, uh, you know, are getting shut down like all the time, um, you know, to get this idea of installing your own software again without an app store, um, that that's a huge boon in in at least reclaiming some control of the data you can receive, perhaps not so much what you can send out, but at least what you can receive. Um yeah, I, I love that that that's happened uh, in in the past year. That that's a that's a great direction for things to go. And even like Twitter, like Twitter, you can easily access. You don't have to install the app. You can just load the mobile website on a you know on a browser, right? So you know there's there's option. You don't. I mean, this is this is a point I've been bringing up a lot in the past year on Sovereign Tech. Um, you should really consider every app not to be software, but to actually be an attack vector. Like right. the more apps you have. And the more, especially the more accounts you have, the more attack vectors there are on you. And so if you don't have to install these things or you don't have to have accounts or whatever, like by all means, do not. Um, mm -hmm. If you do have to install them, Telegram's direction is the way to go. But if you can help it, yeah, maybe just run it through a web browser. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. And I, I will attest to, I had to, uh, um, I had to install, I was going to install the uh, um, Float uh, um, social media platform, um, install their app, but they, mm -hmm, they've mm -hmm. gotten removed because they refused to, they've gotten removed from app stores because they refused to censor. Um, so like I, right, I, I actually right. had to find their APK file and install it and it was just super easy because I've tried on the ghost pad that I have. Um, like I've tried to mm -hmm. install things, but like, I can't figure it out. Like it's, it's still like for me and I'm not, I'm not retarded when it comes to this shit, but like for, for me, it was no, still, right. it was still to the point where like, I was, I can't figure this out, whatever. Uh, but the, the, the ghost phone, yeah. it, went, it went really well. So yes, again, attesting to, to the user friendliness of this stuff, which I mean, thankfully it, it would be bad if it was within five years I hadn't gotten easier. So I guess this should just be the normal trajectory, but I, right. am, I am happy to see it no, nonetheless. But, uh. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and there's no reason this stuff can't be easy. Um, you know, I know there was a concern. I actually, I did a whole episode on it, I, but I know there was a concern around, um, like F droid was starting to ban apps as well, which F droid is an app repository for Android that a lot of these projects like Calix OS or others, you know, or at least can take advantage of whether or not they do directly. Um, but, you know, I just want to make it like clear here on this episode, F droid is still a totally valid thing to use. I don't like that they're getting political either, but Afteroid allows you to pull from your own repositories that you can set up yourself or, you know, that somebody could set up, you know, like, like Jamin could set one up or, you know, whatever, um, or I could. And so there's no reason not to use a great open source app like that. You know, even if you don't like its repositories, you can just end up, you know, using it, using another. So again, I mean, what, what we're saying here, solutions exist, you know, and they're available and, and things are getting easier. Yes. Yes, uh, definitely, definitely. So I, I don't want to. I, I want to get back to the to the dark to the dark Android stuff and have a more more thorough discussion on that. Yeah, sure. But more more of kind of an introductory topic here and still related to the tech, um, in, in some way. Um, but yeah, I do apologize if it seems like a radical shift for for the audience here. But um, anyway, uh, you you mentioned <laughs> on episode two hundred that you you were kind of setting out on you were setting out or planning on um, planning on a a van nomad adventure. So. I was wondering if he could uh, sure. uh, maybe expand upon that a little bit um, here and uh, also, I guess, more in, in particular to Sovereign Tech. Uh, um, I know, like, I, I've watched, you know, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of Van Nomad conversion videos, um, you know, from, from the mm -hmm. lowest from the lowest tech all the way up to, you know, like the, I guess, the highest tech that I've, that I've seen. So I'm, I'm curious on your, your tech loadout, too, and if you have any, any interesting ideas, any interesting ideas in mind there. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know how much custom I'm doing. I mean, as far as like equipment that I actually carry with me, that might be a little more, you know, of, of a custom affair. Um, but I mean, the the van that uh, that Ellen and I will be using, we're going to be we plan on going for, for at least a year, you know, doing just going around 
um, uh, the colonies here and <laughs> uh, try try to hit as many of them as we can uh, and certainly, you know, get to connect with, uh, you know, other liberty minded people who, who are all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as, as and I, I know you certainly understand this, you know, as you do a podcast for so long, you kind of build up a, a little community and it could be really, you know, uh, enriching, frankly, you know, to finally like meet a lot of these people mm -hmm. and have two way communication instead of just the one way communication of a podcast. And so it'll be fun to go around and, and connect with people. Uh, I I'm pretty sure there's a, there's a trip to Pasnia involved. So yeah. <laughs> you know, that'll More be happening. That. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, but I, I, as far as the van itself, um, it will be keeping it pretty, pretty simplistic as far as like, so there's a, there's a company called goal zero. Um, they offer a lot of really, really great kit, um, for, well, that's popular with conversion tricks, uh, for vans and particularly like for, as far as power, I think that's the first thing anybody, you know, really asks about. Um, mm -hmm. but they have, it's the Yeti 1500 X, um, that's that's the power station that I'm going to end up using, and that can actually be directly charged right off of the second battery in the van, um, you're right off the alternator, I should say. Um, and so th that that's what we'll be doing as far as power goes. Uh, there, I do also plant like so a lot of conversions. They want to do where they'll add on solar panels to a van. Um, my, I have two concerns around doing that. A, usually doing those solar panels right to where you can really take advantage of them and where they essentially become worth the cost. Uh, you're going to make some changes to essentially the, I guess what we'll call the structural integrity of the van. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't really want to do that. Um, also, I mean, you know, when when this trip is over, it's a van I plan on continuing to use. And often enough, you know, I'm in... Uh, you know, areas that experience some pretty harsh winters. Uh, so I don't really want to, you know, be so reliant upon solar where, where it may not be always so practical. And I really don't want to make that many changes uh, to the van. So the, the Yeti 1500X, that can, you, you can get like these briefcase um, solar panels that you can set out aside and you can actually use that to charge, in this case, the Yeti uh, uh, battery. And it's particularly, it's, I think it's called the Boulder 200 is the one that I'm getting. It's, it's, it, it folds up to like the size of a briefcase. It's, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. But so there's the advantage of that. So I don't have to do any structural changes to the van, uh, at least exterior. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also, you know, parking, like constantly parking the van where it can get the sunlight. I mean, you know, it, it, you're going to cook <laughs> inside of that van. Yeah. Um so it could be advantageous, perhaps like while you're driving, you know, some would say, but then, you know, even with solar panels or even when you have a solar setup like that, usually you're going to charge your batteries, you know, in your van via your alternator anyway. So, so it's kind of redundant. So I think having like just an external kit, you know, like, like the Boulder 200 that I could set, um, you know, however far away while I can still park under a tree um, is something that I think makes the most sense. And also, I mean, the price difference is, I mean, you're talking hundreds of dollars compared to thousands of dollars, um, you know, as far as like what it costs to actually do a full con a solar conversion structurally on the van as to just having a briefcase that could charge your battery um, anyway. So that's, that's my solution as, as far as, um, as far as you know power source yeah and that's that um, and, and if i could jump in real quick that's that's i think um, yeah. when i was when i was looking i guess yeah four years ago um uh, into mm -hmm. my van nomad adventure obviously watching again hunt these hundreds upon hundreds of videos um i, I think i was yeah. looking into that exact same one uh or the, uh, something similar um a similar model back then because mm -hmm. i wasn't you know super technical back then where i i, I wanted where i wanted to install um, like I was going to install the solar panels, but I didn't want to have to do all the wiring and the charge controller and all that shit. I just want to be able to plug it directly right. into um, this effing thing and have it work. Yep. Because if you run it yep. yourself, if you do it yourself and you have like a short or something, you got to you got to figure out where the f that short is in your system. And if you didn't do it, yeah. if you didn't do it the best way, it might be a major pain in the ass if you're out on the road. So I was I was I think I was already looking into a system like that. Um, whenever I was uh, considering yeah. considering the Nomad thing, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's another part for me is I like to be able to replace parts, you know, and like do so quickly, like if whatever blows, you know, be it the the solar panels or well, not that they blow, but you know what I mean? I just like to be able to pull something out, you know, toss it and or not 
Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, I <laughs> and then you. put in a new one. Um, I don't necessarily want to toss. If I can repair it, great. Um, but uh, but I don't want it. Again, I really don't like things to be so tied to you know to the structure of the van itself. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely fair. And I guess I hadn't thought about. Um, but yeah, you are you are right. Like a lot of those like a lot of these folks are down in the south. Um, you know, during the, obviously stay mm -hmm. with the warm weather because it's. Um, yeah. Anyway, there's le there's less van nomads in Canada. I'll just put it that way. But like, yeah, like you get you imagine yeah. if they're charging <laughs> yeah. if they're charging their batteries and they have solar panels, then they're and they're in the desert, then they're sitting in the hot ass desert or they're driving. So yes, that is a good point. Mm -hmm. I feel like that could be um, uncomfortable um, if you if you had to uh, entirely, um, yeah, park out in the sun. It's fair. Yeah, I mean, and we're gonna we have a cat with us um, that you know that that's gonna be riding along, and you know you don't don't need him baking or anything. <laughs> so <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, so beyond, I mean, you know, as far as that goes, I mean, as far as kit that I'm bringing along, right, yep, um, yep. yeah, I mean, there's, you know, every, everybody brings a laptop, right? I mean, everybody needs a laptop, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I guess I'll start off with as far as like, how do I get internet? So I explained how I get, how I'll have power, um, as far as internet goes, uh, I don't like this and it's something that I really want to work on more of a solution for, um, but I will be using that same Pixel 6. I actually, I use Google Fi. Now, obviously, screw Google, you, you know, <laughs> that, that, that should go without saying. Um, at the same time, like I still have, you know, nine to five work that I do. And then, I, you know, it's remote. And so I, I can do it while, while van lifing. Um, so there's, there's aspect of the, uh, uh, the first realm, digital realm <laughs> that, that I still have to, uh, you know, connect with in, in varying ways. So it's something that at least for now, you know, makes a degree of sense. Um, if I'm ever in a scenario where I don't want that kind of tracking on me, I certainly know how to temporarily remove that situation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if need be. But um, so I Google Fi, you know, despite it being Google does a million things right as far as connectivity, kind of like you were talking about with the ghost phone, how you're connected through Tor and a VPN and all that. Like Google Fi by nature goes through a VPN. Yes, it's Google's VPN. That sucks. Um, certainly I could do, you know, alternate things. Um, but the main thing with, with Google Fi that, that's really advantageous is it doesn't, as far as a phone plan goes, is that it doesn't care what, how much data or like what you're using the data for. Like if you're using it to tether you know, like your laptop to it or something like that. It just charges you based on the amount of data. It also doesn't matter where you are. Um, so, cause there's also times where I kind of have to travel the world a bit, whether or not I'll have to do that while van lifing, cause I could get into interesting air, uh, uh, scenarios. I don't know how exactly that would work. Um, but it essentially works anywhere. It's not like with AT&T or any of these guys where you have to call them up and say, Hey, I'm going into Canada. Could you give me this decreased rate? Everything's just essentially a flat rate. And for 120 bucks, you know, um, a, mo a month, you get unlimited data and all this stuff and unlimited data everywhere. And they don't care if you're tethering or not. Again, I could work out to where all this stuff, you know, I could do all of this anyway. It would end up probably costing around the same to do it. But that's, that is what I'm using for internet. Um, but at the same time, I also don't like to really use, like hold my smartphone and use my smartphone much. Um, so the main thing that my smartphone would do would just be tethering to, you know, other devices and particularly um, a laptop. Um, I mean, for, you know, as far as smartphones go, you know, there are smartphones now that have phenomenal battery life. Like the Pixel 6 that I mentioned, you know, has essentially a two day battery. Granted, if it was tethering that whole time or being a hotspot that whole time, you know, it would go a lot quicker. Um, but that has a really good battery life. Um, another phone uh, is like a Moto G Power that we're literally, it has a battery life that can go like four days. So battery life in any of my devices is a really key factor. Even though I have, you know, a great charging solution, um, I still want to use that as little, you know, as possible. Um, so battery life on anything that I'm bringing along with me is, is really, really key. Yeah. Um, now, you know, all that, all go ahead, please. Oh, I was just going to bring up one thing on, in terms of the internet, this is a fantastic, fantastic yeah. solution that I just recently came across and I've got it. I've done it on the, on my, on, on my dark phone, my, uh, you know, my black ghost phone. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, I tested this out and whether, if I think it's your U S UK, um, service right now, but, um, silent dot link, you can get a mm. uh, you can pay for data with bitcoin anonymously or you can get like an actual us or uk identity for like 60 bucks in f and bitcoin 
And um, well, you, yeah, you can't you yeah. can't like send text, <laughs> send or like make calls. But like for two factor authentication stuff, you can you have incoming text mm-hmm. and voice. Um, and then you also have mobile mobile data too. So like it's such an incredible um, such an incredible solution. And sixty bucks, um, you scan and it's just yeah. an eSIM card. Um, so it's absolutely nuts that that exists now. Um, and it's funny. So I I'm still on. I'm, yep. So I, I had recently had to switch over to a different carrier, and it's a, it's it takes them mm-hmm. hours to get new accounts set up. And it took like thirty seconds. Yeah. I, I sent the Bitcoin, and I sent the Bitcoin, scanned a <laughs> QR code for the SM card, and it's just like done. It's like Jesus Christ, I've got a phone number now. And it was not you know paid in Bitcoin. <laughs> so like it's it's nuts uh, that some of the yeah. solutions that are out there. So I'll mention that as well because I can use that one for a hotspot. And and yeah. the other cool thing about that too is. Um, with with this service, this silent dot link, um, you can actually see what networks are available, and you can choose which one to connect to. So, like Verizon or AT and T, or if there's even um, even other you know towers nearby. So it's it's it, so it, again, as you were saying earlier, and as I say a lot on the spot, there are always solutions. There are always solutions. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's actually that's really great. That's something I got to look into more because one of the things I'd really love to see developed, and it was something I actually years ago I thought I thought this was the direction a lot of technology was going to go, but then I realized, wait, that's just too consumer friendly and makes sense. So no, that's not what they're going to do. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I was, I was expecting at one point that, you know, companies like, I mean, you know, take your pick Samsung, Apple, whoever, that eventually they would just come out with like a little like pebble sized device. That is, a, that is really just internet. Like it's just a router, you know, or it's just a, just a hotspot that you carry with you. And then you have all your separate devices and they all essentially co- connect to that one hotspot that, you know, it's really tiny that you always have with you. Um, I think that's a project that still has a lot of validity to do. And I think you could get some of the, like you could convert some of these Android smartphones, especially ones that have the gigantic batteries in them. Um, and, you know, create like these, you know, more of these uh, stealthy hotspots um, that you could take advantage of. Because here's the thing. so. Like with smartphones, you have to go through quite a bit, or you have to buy from from uh, from Jamin, you know. But you have to go through quite a bit uh, to get that in any way remotely secure. And even then, privacy is kind of up in the air. Um, it, that depends on how hard you work at that, because that's more of a mindset than it is necessarily a technology that you have installed. Um, but with a laptop or with a computer, a traditional computer, the options are just blown open on that on how well you can secure and uh, keep private, you know, what you're doing with a device like that as compared to a smartphone. So, you know, like that, that's, I I guess, kind of coming full circle, that's an area where uh, that I'll I'll kind of be relying upon where, okay, sure, everything's being funneled through, you know, my Google Fi connection, but then at the same time, I'm protecting so much of that data, you know, more through the use, um, you know, of my laptop, uh, which I have, you know, just, just, infinitely more control over, um, you know, as, as far as uh, what gets uh, sprayed and prayed out there with it, as far as data goes. But um, anyway, yeah, uh, so battery life is is really, really key. Uh, I have, I, I actually, I've gone to, you know, something we were kind of alluding to earlier. Um, we're really at the point where everything that, that uh, the, the new hotness is really the old hotness, meaning that, that like going back to older technologies, and I mean, even as simple as, buying like six, seven, you know, even 10 year old laptops as compared to the latest, whatever nonsense um, is really the way to go today. And for, for a multitude of reasons, one is, I mean, good luck even getting a lot of new computers because of supply chain, you know, chip shortages and all that. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, but also, yeah, yeah. I mean, like that, that's, that's a very real issue. I mean, the other part that I like about kind of what I was speaking to earlier is that I like things that are repairable. Older computers generally, I mean, like the one I use or that I'll be taking with me is particularly, it's a, uh, a Dell Latitude 7280. The computer's about five, six years old. You know, it's a couple screws, the whole bottom pops off and you can replace everything inside of it. Um, I mean, look, you know, when you're on the road, you know, and you don't have like an easy mailing address at all times, um, you know, that it's kind of a necessity to be able to do that. And another thing, another reason that I recommend these kinds of laptops like Dell's or like Lenovo ThinkPads, um, is there, there are shops all over the country, really all over the world that specifically repair like enterprise class computers for either, and you, they're usually near colleges 
or they'll be, you know, like, like near whatever industrial park that exists outside of a city. And, you know, you, you can get parts, you can get your, if, if, even if you don't know how to do it, you can pay them to fix it. And, you know, they, they love doing it. I've, I've worked with many of these companies in the past. Um, so it's a great way to ensure that your, your digital equipment, you know, like it, it's almost an insurance policy without having to, you know, rely on Amazon shipping boxes at gas stations or whatever. Uh, right. cause again, these, these companies are, or, you know, these repair services are everywhere. So that, that was a really key thing for me as well is to make sure I'm using a laptop, um, that, that is repairable either by me or very quickly repairable, uh, just about anywhere that I am. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, um, I guess I hadn't really thought about that angle on, um, I guess the self sufficiency tech van nomad thing. But um, that's yeah, that's that's great. Mm -hmm. um, getting that you're talk, talking about, you know, choosing choosing items with you know or choosing um, choosing devices with super long battery lives and yeah, yeah all that. Um, yeah, repairability. Yeah, I like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. That is uh, an angle I had not had not really heard or even thought of before. So I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, my laptop's kind of my main thing. I mean, sure, you know, also people like to have fun. I mean, I have, I have tablet, you know, I have a tablet that I use for, for reading stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of great things at the Pasnia library I got to get, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, when it's available and yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, video, yeah, when it's available, that's right. <laughs> um, and you know, I mean, I have gaming systems and all that stuff, but everything, I mean, this is another part too, is, uh, I'm really keen on, you know, having like, I'll have the little, like, uh, you know, 20,000 milliampere batteries, you know, external batteries that you can charge smartphones with or other devices. Um, I try to have everything have a unified uh, connector. That way I'm not carrying a ton of wires. I mean, because if you have, you know, frankly, if you have more than two or three devices, you could end up with like 20 different, I mean, really, even though the math doesn't seem to add up, you can end up with like 20 different connectors that you're going to need uh, for these things. And so I am very particular in as best as I can help it, having everything have a, a USB-C port on it. So that way I can essentially, you know, use the same charger just about anywhere. And I mean, anything to just lighten that that tech load, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a good thing. Um, so that, that's another key part with just about everything I have is I, I try to be very selective with that. Um, even that older laptop I mentioned also has a USB-C port, even though I can't really use it for charging. But, um, you know, just trying to keep things simplified in that way. Um, let's see. An another part, well, I, I do keep, uh, you know, I will be carrying a Baofeng radio with me, you know, the classic uh, uh, UVR. Yeah. Or, or uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that thing. I think everybody, boy, if there's something everybody should be, because those, those so even the, like those lower end Baofeng radios, you know, handheld radios, um, they were selling for like a hundred bucks in, 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 in 2020, in middle 2020, uh, when really they shouldn't cost more than 30, but if they were selling for like a hundred dollars, if you could even find them, um, it, because everybody, you know, thought the world was going to end or whatever. Right. And, you know, I get it. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's a great thing. Like now they're, they're back in stock. There's plenty of them. They only cost you 30 bucks. Everybody should have one of those. Everybody should be learning how to, how to use, you know, two-way radios. Um, because that, that's, that is literally the tech they can't shut down. Um, I mean, a solar storm might, but you know, th that's, that's not the government and <laughs> as much as they wish it would or wish they were, um, Anyway, so yeah, I think that's a handy thing to have. I will be, you know, bringing one of those around or, you know, a set of those around with me uh, as well to use. Um, beyond, beyond that on, on tech loadout, I mean, that's, that covers a lot of it. That keeps things pretty simple. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, again, because of like the tablet that I use, I don't really have to carry a ton of books with me. I mean, I read all the time. Um, but it's easy enough, you know, eBooks are, are wonderful things. Not that I want paper books to go anywhere, but like eBooks are just phenomenal. The, the kind of library you can carry with you at, at, at any point. Um, so I'm certainly not worried about entertainment in any, any, any stretch. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm never going to be bored. I know that. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, I think, I think that fairly covers my tech loadout unless you have any questions on that. Sure. Yeah. That's uh that's, that's great, man. Um, I actually came across, um, I, uh, came across in one of the podcasts I was listening to crystal radios and I uh, found a website where it's, you can get like a hundred dollar crystal mm -hmm. radio kit. Like they used to, I guess prisoners have made them in prison to communicate with the outside. Like they're super, super easy yep. to make. They don't require much. Um, but I'm going to dig it. Like that, that's another, you know, project at some point I'll, I'll, I'll do just for the hell of it. Like, I, I don't know. It's a fun experiment, fun project. Um, 
but uh yeah absolutely. yeah and they can, certainly yeah. can't shut that down um <laughs> i don't know how useful it is necessarily no. yeah. but um that's a that's a different uh it's a different story yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's more useful when you're in a community but uh sure. You know, all, all the same. I mean, it's a standard that everybody can take advantage of. So to some degree, wherever you go, it can be useful. Um, it's just there's got to be other people, you know. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So um, we've, we've kind of been covered. We've kind of been talking about it, you know, off and on this whole time, so this, this whole you know conversation so far. But um, I would I'd like to get, uh, you mm -hmm. know, kind of a, um, a more formal 2022 dark Android update. Um, I talked about my experience with the ghost phone. Um, I guess, uh, the, the sure. a couple of questions I have just since, you know, from, from my use, uh, any, you know, VPN recommendations, if you have any, I think, I, um, you know, two hop ones, preferably if you, if you got any, if you got any on, on mind, um, and then other security and privacy tools that, that you uh, think are, that, that are newer that you think are definitely worthwhile for, you know, this, for this year and, and forthcoming. Yeah, sure. Um, well, Mulvad, which is M U L L V A D, um, they are out of Switzerland. Um, Mulvad is probably the best VPN out there right now. Um, private internet access was my recommendation for years. They just got bought out, or actually it was a couple of years ago, they got bought out um, by this massive conglomerate, like like VPN conglomerate. They also, the, the same people also recently bought ExpressVPN. Um, but the, the funny, like this company is so nasty. They, they literally, they, they didn't just buy up like a bunch of VPN services. They also bought up VPN review sites and so wow. like they're engaging where, where their, their, their review sites are recommending all of them because they own them, you know? So is this, is I mean, this, just, is this one of those companies that was, moves. that's, you know, financed by NQTEL or maybe it's the alphabet agencies or something kind of sounds like it. Yeah. But, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, they do have a very ugly history. They've rebranded a couple times. I'm not even sure what their latest name is, but yeah. Uh, so you want to steer clear. I mean, the only two I really now that I recommend, there's Mulvad, which is my top one. I'll explain why. The other is AirVPN. They're really good. Um, they've been around for a long time. They they were one of the first ones to accept Bitcoin. And I mean, we're talking years ago. Uh, and they're based out of Europe, which some people might, you know, what Mulvad is as well. Some people may prefer that because they feel that the uh, regulatory environment for uh, their data in Europe is better than it is in the United States. And while technically that's true, frankly, I think ever since the Cloud Act, uh, was put in, you know, was, was, was put into law. Uh, I, I don't think there's any real advantage to, to using European services anymore. Um, not in that way where if you're worried that your data is somehow naturally more protected because the cloud act essentially says, you know, no, we're the U S handed over, um, yeah. you know, and then they kind of do vice versa. But, um, but Mulvad, I think, is, is a really great VPN, partly because, you know, I, we mentioned earlier, like about, you know, the more accounts you have, that's the more vulnerabilities you have. Uh, Mulvad, you don't have to have an account at all. Uh, you can pay in Bitcoin. Um, you go to their website. They will generate a one-time page on the website that will give you an account number. And all you don't, there's no password. There's none of that. You don't have to be responsible for anything except for that account number. And whatever, you know, however you install Mulvad or connect to it, whether you're using like an open source uh, client um, or if you're using one of their official apps, all of which are very nice open source, um, all you have to do is put in that account number and it just it logs you in, you know, and, and you're all set. Um, now, I like that for a lot of reasons, especially when you can pay for Bitcoin, because that creates a ton of deniability on your part to where you know, like they can say, well, this person set it up and, you know, they use, use this password or whatever. And, and with Mulvad's case, no, like, okay, it's an account, but anybody could have had access to that account number theoretically. Right. And you don't know how it was paid for. It was done with Bitcoin. So it was, you know, pseudonymous at least. Um, and so you're not beholden to what you do on that VPN, or at least that's, if you take the right steps, that's how I think it goes. Um, so yeah, Mulvad is my top pick. Also, they use WireGuard, just where AirVPN is still using OpenVPN. WireGuard is a new uh, VPN protocol. Um, I'm a big fan of it. It's very fast. It's something baked right into the Linux kernel now. Uh, and Mulvad was really one of the first companies to implement that. Others have now. But um, yeah, I think they do great work. So uh, that, that's that's my recommendation. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's interesting. So I um, I I looked into and yeah, I so just recently and it sucks because I was finally in a position where I was gonna you know I was gonna you know pay for it and and actually you know like I'm stepping on my security. Mm -hmm. But um, Paul Rosenberg and Smuggler's Crypto Hippie went down or they 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 closed they closed doors you know digi their digital doors. Um, I guess it was some sometime yep. this year or late last year. 
And uh, yeah, theirs was, um, you know, that, that's, I, I interviewed Paul back in 2018. I'm going to re- release those podcasts on the on the Vani feed here um, over the coming weeks. But um, yeah, he uh, he mentioned mm-hmm. back then. I didn't know I didn't know a distinction, but like the one hop versus two hop um, VPNs. Um, so there theirs right. was theirs was one of the few um, that was actually two hop. And um, they had a very interesting, I guess, I'll, I'll, you know, uh, the interesting legal setup um, to, you know, shield users and such. Um, so like it's it's uh, it's unfortunate <laughs> that one's that that one that one went down. I actually uh, I, I I'm yeah. test, I'm testing out Proton VPN right now. Um, Rise VPN comes stock mm-hmm. with will come stock with um, with the Calyx OS, or at least they did on these on on the Ghost phones. But uh, um, right. I I looked it up and I, I'm not sure if may, maybe I maybe I misread or something. I thought Proton VPN was too hot, but it might not be too hot. But anyway, yeah yeah the the Bitcoin um, yeah, paid in Bitcoin all that good stuff, but. Um, yeah, but do you, yeah, do you know? Do you know Proton VPN is good. Go yeah. ahead. I was going to ask, ask specifically about two. Uh, about, I was going to say two hot VPNs. Or, yeah, um, I mean Proton. So Proton VPN is pretty good. Part part of the reason I actually like that and almost went with it was due to that um, it is available. Like the client itself is available in the Afteroid store, which I think is amazing. Um, I'm surprised more VPN companies, you know, don't don't do that. Um, but that is, in my understanding, is they are two hop. So I, yeah, like I, 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 I think you're right about that. Oh, well, that'd um, be good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I do like Proton VPN as well. I, I, I think I keep forgetting about it because, like, I mean, I love Proton Mail. Um, but I, that's what I always think of them as, as, as Proton Mail. I mean, and they have interesting things coming too. Like they're trying to do an entire like Google alternative, where they're creating like a Google Drive alternative that can be done. Mm-hmm via you know you know through proton mail servers and everything and i i really like that um i know some people have concerns around proton mail now because there was a um uh an environmental activist in france who um was caught uh, or let's see he was in switzerland but he was getting he, the french police were coming after him and the french police petitioned the swiss government to you know like can you give us the data whatever data exists on this guy mm-hmm. and they did get the data from proton mail um you know the french government was able to to acquire that data uh, so a lot of people were saying oh let, let's you know let's not touch proton mail and blah 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 um but i i don't agree with that sentiment um any just about any company you can imagine is going to hand over whatever data that they possibly have the best thing is is that they don't have a whole lot of data, the data to hand over on you with, yeah. and go ahead yeah, I was gonna, don't give them the data to hand over. Yeah, right, right. Place. Yeah, just just don't have data. Yeah. Um, so, but the thing is, just about any service, and this includes Signal, we'll go down the list. Like, the one piece of data just about every service on the planet is going to have is when was the last time you logged in? You know, when was the last time you accessed their server? And there, there's not a whole ton, you know, you can really do about that. I mean, there, you know, there's some things you can route your traffic in certain ways, but still, that's you know, it's attached to an account often enough. Um, so that's it's it's sadly kind of par for the course um but i don't think i don't think proton mail was in any way being malicious uh you know they, they yeah i i don't think they liked doing what they did but anyway i i that's another thing i did a whole episode on it really needed one to cover it so but i just wanted to put that out there sure sure um yeah yeah i I'd, I'd heard some similar i hear stuff i hear, hear stuff like that uh, a lot of times but i i don't know like i i don't have time to track down all of those and and generally i i do i do keep i do keep right. a lookout for for those sorts of things but um a lot of times like i'll hear it's just mm-hmm. it's a lot of times it's it's fear mongering like it's like oh you know this is this isn't secure anymore it's like they access via the guy's password on his phone like it doesn't mean the encryption's insecure if they accessed yeah. it by accessing his phone um i think there's a recent and recent recent exactly. case signal like that uh was it uh um the oath keepers uh was Stuart rhodes got um got yes. raided and uh that's what i heard is like oh signal's not secure anymore and i went and looked at it and i was like well it's, it looks like just from the articles i read they like access his phone like there's nothing no nothing bad about signal on that part so you got to be careful like i i don't know like those those could be uh you know those could be psyops or whatever um in the sense that they're trying to get people to stop using secure secure software i don't know yeah i yeah anytime i hear that sort of thing the other argument that comes up all the time is it's like well but this they're funded by like uh part of the budget for the u.s navy you know and which signal and like tor and some of these things are they genuinely are um but the thing that people miss about that you know and i mean i 
I was in the U.S. military myself. Uh, the thing that people don't understand about that is that a lot of time that funding, yes, it's coming from the U.S. Navy. But so legally, the U.S. Navy um, is like they they have uh, how to put this on, on their on their spreadsheets, <laughs> like they're, they're as compared to other alphabet soup organizations or divisions, um, you know, of the government, um, like for foreign uh, applications, essentially for foreign policy, foreign actions, um, it's a lot easier for money to kind of go in that direction. So, so the point I'm getting at is anytime you see a U.S. Navy budget, especially in something related to cryptography or anything like that, it's probably CIA. Like there, there's a very high chance of that now, but here's the thing. So a lot of people say, Ooh, that's bad. That's so bad. You know, because, uh, you know, the CIA is funding it. So there must be back doors and all this other stuff. No, 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 no. The, <laughs> the CIA needs these tools too. <laughs> okay. Right, like, yes. And, they, and that's, they need that's them, part they need, of why they, they need them to them. be secure. Right. <laughs> yeah. They want to use them. Themselves. Exactly. Right. So it's almost, an, I mean, as bad as it is, it's almost an argument for using them because if the CIA does, you know, like, okay, well, again, they're funding it. It's just like, I mean, this is the same argument I've had for Bitcoin forever. Like Bitcoin is never going to drop, is never going to go to zero. It's just never going to happen. Why? Because the CIA uses Bitcoin. They love it. You know, like un untraceable money, please give us more, you know, like that, that's, that's totally their attitude <laughs> on it. And that's why, I mean, for many of like the first few years of Bitcoin, I think part of its valuation completely came from the fact that it was being, you know, I mean, it was being used for charity and wonderful things. I'm not knocking Bitcoin at all. I never would. Um, but I mean, at the same time, it was probably being used for buying weapons and who knows whatever else by, you know, by nation states. So that that's part of the reason that it's, it's value, you know, even did what it did uh, early on, I think. But yeah. So, you know, saying that, oh, there's government money in it. Look, there's, gov you know, there's government money everywhere. You can't, you cannot avoid that. Uh, in every single project, it's, it, you know, the heat maps read everywhere. So yeah, just, just try and be, you know, as informed as you can on these things. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, lots of tentacles, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, yes. I've been trying, yeah. I, I never really had that many, um, you know, that many ties to the first round to begin with. Uh, I started getting, I, I you know, mm -hmm. I came across anarchism when I was, you know, 20, 20 I think I was 20. So, um, like I, I, I right connected that many ties, but it's still not easy and there's still a lot of tentacles. Um, but uh, that was a, a good segue yeah. to um, coming up on about an hour. And uh, I wanted to make sure um, I think that's a, a, sure. a great, great discussion so far on fortifying the digital second realm. And we can obviously have you back on to chat about that more. But um, I wanted to I remember, uh, I guess it would have been a number of months back and it has been a little while. So if I if I miss say anything of yours, please, please do correct me. But. Um, on the uh, on the Gora, sure. already talking about your somewhat BTC only views. I think it was in the context of um, the decentralized travel network that we're, we're trying to put together, um, and uh, one of them brought up using Ethereum or, or blockchain for it. And you you kind of uh, I don't remember exactly what you said on it, but it, it, it but it, it, it definitely <laughs> seemed kind of somewhat BTC only. So um, I guess uh, um, I'll turn it over to you there, kind of a general. What it, I guess what what are your views on? Um, I guess if you, if you want to rehash your views on the, like why not use Ethereum or blockchain for the decentralized travel network or, you know, just sure. uh, your views on, on the, you know, the crypto versus Bitcoin space generally. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I'm still, you know, incredibly, uh, to use a term, you know, still incredibly bullish, um, on, well, particularly Bitcoin. There's, there's other cryptocurrencies that I like. Um, the thing is, you know, I, I've been in the crypto space you know, and I've spoke at conferences. I've, you know, I mean, I've, I've just, I've been knee deep in it since 2010. You know, I've been knee deep, deep in it forever. Um, it, or almost as long as it's been around. And, you know, in that amount of time, like, I mean, in, in, in six months in the, in what, what I call the tech world in six months, you know, a million things can change. There, there can be complete one eighties, you know, a thousand companies could be, could, could rise and fall in that time. Um, but in 10 years, like I have seen so much crap and so many promises, so many, you know, like, oh yeah, we're working on this. We're working on that. And some of these things, you know, sure. Like, like there's, there's ideas out there, blockchain ideas uh, that, yeah. Okay. I could believe it, that it would take 20 years to develop this thing, you know, because it's doing something that's just never been done before. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, we're, I mean, and, and I think you're the same way, you know, we're, we're, we're practical people and we want our freedom now. Um, and, and we don't necessarily want to wait. So when you get it done, great, we'll talk about it. But otherwise, you know, I'm not going to, um, not going to have you on, uh, you know, to, to, to talk about, you know, your project that you're working on that may or may not come out in 10 years. 
Right. Um, so we've been dealing with with a lot of that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's so bad. Like I used to, man, I used to get emails where people are like, oh, I think, you know, like a, a quote unquote listener would email in and say, hey, you know, you, you should have this guy on, you know, to talk about his latest blockchain bullshit. And and I'd be like, no, I know what this is. Like, you're not a you're not even a listener. Like, you're just this, you're this company's marketing team. And you're probably one person and you're just trying to get this ass hat on, you know. And oh, anyway, the, the, the space is replete with that. And, and that's really, I think, the lesson that's been learned in 10 years. In, in crypto is the space is just absolutely replete with scammers, with people who are just out to make, you know, the quick buck, the quick pump and dump and all of this. Um, I mean, the beauty of Bitcoin, two things. One, the beauty of Bitcoin was that the community, especially early on, was so incredibly passionate that that's part of the reason why I think there was a lot of easier trust uh, early on, you know, 2012, 2013 and so on. Um, with a lot of even other blockchain projects, because if you're into blockchain, even if you're just into Bitcoin at that time, it was a pretty good bet you were, you know, libertarian or, you know, liberty oriented in some way. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I mean, just like scammers came in, you know, and 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 then the legacy system came in and they started getting in on, on all of this. And now the second part that's the beauty of Bitcoin is that it is figureheadless. Like there is, yep. there, there's no one to go Satoshi's after. gone. Okay. Yep. Right. There's nobody. To, yeah, exactly. There's nobody to go after. The only thing you can go after is the code and the code's open source. So you can't do shit about it, you know, and anybody can develop it and do whatever they need, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there, you know, there's yeah. a, there's a team around it, but that's a, that it, it's, it's a, it's an amazing development process that Bitcoin goes through more so than any other, really any other blockchain project out there. Everyone else has a figurehead. Everyone else has a, has a cult of personality, be it Vitalik, be it, um, I don't know, go down the list. Uh, that you can essentially kind of go after because that cult of personality, that person can also not just, maybe he's not even writing the code anymore for the project, but his opinion holds a lot of sway. There is, I mean, there's people who are influencers, I guess you could say in the Bitcoin space, but by and large, like the one guy, quote unquote guy, who, you know, maybe could have had that kind of sway doesn't exist or isn't here or, you know, whatever the situation is. And so I love that about Bitcoin, that there's no God, you know, in Bitcoin. And that's exactly how it should be. Uh, and I mean, it, it goes beyond that, but because so Bitcoin, now you have things like lightning network, which I approve of these developments. I, I think they're great, which allows, uh, you know, Bitcoin to do a lot more than just be essentially be digital gold. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with that. And part of the reason I'm fine with that is that Bitcoin itself, because so many people are passionate about it, because so many, there's such, there's such a network effect around it with so many people involved in it. It's essentially the most secure network on the planet. I mean, it, it blows away any other server farm out there. Like there, there's just nothing that comes close to the level of security involved with Bitcoin. So I feel a lot more confident about projects getting developed off of Bitcoin than I am about some upstart coming out of nowhere, which I can respect their passion, you know, and, and maybe what they want to do. Um, but, you know, if, if you have the choice of going with something new or something tried and true in the most secure network on the planet, what am I going to do? Of course, I'm going to go with the most secure network mm -hmm. on the planet. And again, it's not something that can get shut down. It's open source. Anybody can run this stuff, you know, as long as you have a big enough hard drive. Um, right. Yeah. So, so there's, there's that advantage with, with Bitcoin as well. But then, you know, while I do approve lightning network, I like that it's all this stuff being done. That's like off chain. So you're not affecting necessarily the direct code, you know, of Bitcoin. Um, a lot of these other projects, their concepts of, you know, smart contracts of NFTs, which those are utter nonsense. Um, Thank you. Which, you know, what, what, it, yeah, <laughs> like whatever project you can imagine that they want to do, or like this term that's getting bantied about, which is also nonsense, that being Web3, <laughs> um, you know, all these different, what do you got? Sorry. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm thank you. That's all. I'm just, I'm just trying. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, all of these like people wanting to do like social media on blockchain and, and all this other stuff. So a, you know, you've got to prove to me that these things were good ideas before there was a blockchain in the first place. One of, you know, a saying that I've been saying for years is that if it was a, if it was a bad idea off of blockchain, it doesn't become a good one just because it's on blockchain. <laughs> and that's a really key, that's a really key metric to keep in mind with anything that somebody's trying to sell you, um, you know, with, with Ethereum or, you know, go down the list of it. Um, so, you know, they, they want to, so that my point is, 
Like you got to prove to me that what you're wanting to do on with your new blockchain is even a good idea in the first place. And that is a very hard task, at least to me. Um, because then the other part of it comes in, which is the lessons that we've had of what you could call the internet today, that being web 2.0, if you want to, you know, go with colloquialisms. Um, you know, you, you, it's not just that you have to, you have to prove to me that, that they were a good idea necessarily there, but it feels like a lot of these guys, so, so you have web 2.0 and you have a lot of people that made a lot of money on that. And it feels like now we have a lot of people developing blockchains that, okay, so they, they, they essentially bled dry the internet as it is right now. And so they just need to do something else. They just need to make some kind of money. And so now their blockchain project is just taking the same crap, putting a new coat of paint on it, I guess. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and they're saying that, you know, oh yeah, th this is, this is going to be so much better. Why, you know, and, and, but again, it, it's just, it's, it's the same nonsense. And part of the problems with web 2.0 and why even that argument of like, say what, you know, when they want to say, oh, it's web three, it's decentralized, it's this. Uh, part of the problem with what existed on Web 2.0 and why their argument for, say, like Web 3 makes sense is because we know that it's broken on the Internet as we understand it today. But the reason that it's broken on the Internet today is because it's complex and complexity is the enemy of security. OK, like you, you can the more complex you make something, the harder it is to actually secure it. Mm -hmm. um, and. I worry like most blockchain projects outside of Bitcoin, as they just keep on adding on features, adding on features, adding on features, um, you're adding complexity to a space that never required it. You're adding complexity. And again, once you add that complexity, the security starts to go out the window. And so my argument that why use Bitcoin because it's the most secure network on the planet dies with every, almost every other blockchain. That doesn't mean there aren't blockchain projects that are doing interesting things. Like I still, I like Litecoin. Um, I think Monero is, you know, okay, like privacy coins, I think are an interesting idea. Can we do all of these things on Bitcoin? Sure, of course we could. Um, but, you know, so so I'm not, again, I'm not totally Bitcoin only, but I, what I am is anti-complexity when it comes to software, when it comes to the digital realm. Um, mm -hmm. And and all of these blockchain projects are just, I mean, that's all they are is complexity. It's, it's, it's insane. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's 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 all. Yeah, all totally fair, man. And uh, like I, I use uh, like uh, Odyssey, um, which has you know, let's uh, used to be library. So mm -hmm. they got that their library token. Um, so like yeah. I, 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 I would I lean towards you know the the BTC only position. But like if there's something that is actually of value and actually of use, like. I will use it, but the thing is, the library token is superfluous. It's yeah. irrelevant to what I use the platform for. I don't know anyone that trades library tokens, right? So, like, it's not like, um, <laughs> right? It's, it's just it's a different, it's a di it's a different use. No, it's not Bitcoin. Um, so, like, uh, um, mm -hmm. the, and Monero, like, I, 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 that was the, I guess, even when I wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, more BTC only, like I am now, I still. It was only like Bitcoin, Monero, and maybe like one or two other ones, and Monero obviously for the, mm -hmm. for the privacy reasons. But um, there's the the problem I'd run into. Um, you know, I, I only use it for a year, a year, about a year initially, because it just got frustrating with with the, with the right. hard forks and issues with the wall, with their their GUI wallets and such. But I had a hard time get accessing my money at all. Um, and uh, then you just uh, you know a couple few months back, I had had someone make a donation to Pasni with, with Monero. And uh, still, like, mm -hmm. I ran into, like, it was just, it, it took about an hour um, to get it converted over to Bitcoin, like, to, to get it to actually not even get yeah. it converted, but to just to get to the freaking money um, to get to the XMR. So, like, um, that's why, yeah. I, that's why, like, in, in terms of long term um, and in terms of, you know, long term. Um, Bitcoin seems to be it because you can still spend the same exact Bitcoin um, like 10 years ago, the exact same one. Like you can still send that mm -hmm. Bitcoin that you got back then with whereas with any of these other projects that can go through a hard fork, your money may not be usable um, when you go to try to access it um, down, you know, in the future. So that's I guess that's that's that's, right. that's one that's more 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 kind of the economic thing. But um, at the same time, that does uh, you mentioned the um, you know four hundred gigabytes, and you can basically verify every single transaction that's ever occurred on the network. Um, and uh, you know, as Max Hilburn mm -hmm. talked about on this podcast a number of times, like what uh, where else in, in in humanity can everyone come to agreement on anything? Well, you can on the Bitcoin blockchain because every single yeah. person can go verify every transaction themselves. They can run their own node um, to verify that all the consensus rules are being followed. 
and then um, they can you know they can mine they they can contribute to the network in that way and like it's everything is totally verifiable um, and it just it just works it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, again, that importance of not having, and this is, to me, this is Bitcoin's killer app is, is again, not having that figurehead because still one of the, like the reason I'm so anti-Ethereum to this day, and this should still bother people. I don't know why it doesn't, but years ago you had the, the DAO uh, hack, quote unquote hack. It wasn't actually a hack because the guy took whatever 50 million, you know, in, in ETH, um, it, through the programming rules, you know, through the rules that were programmed in it. So it's not really theft, but the point is what did, what did, uh, you know, how did Vitalik, how did the Ethereum team respond? They rewrote history. Yeah. They said, exactly. okay, that, that transaction never happened. And I'm like, wait, wh like who would trust the blood? Who would trust any software like that? Where, where, yep. especially when your money's involved, where, where history gets rewritten. Like, I mean, banks don't even necessarily do that, you know, <laughs> like that, that's, that's madness. Uh, so, you know, that alone, I mean, it's just, it, it's unforgivable. Like you, you could, I could never, how could you ever trust a network like that? Um, and you could say that, oh, Solana wouldn't do that. Or these people wouldn't do that. Yeah. I don't know. Because you know what? Well, you I saw on Twitter. I don't, I don't know any, that, I don't know anything about changes. Solana, yeah. but all I've seen on, I've only seen it brought up on Twitter. Apparently mm -hmm. the network was down for days at a time. Um, just recently. So yes. like the Bitcoin yeah. network's never been down for days at a time. It's hell. It's never been, I mean, more than maybe like. I, I don't know. It's like 99.999% uptime in the past, you know, 10 plus years. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, and part of that is, yeah, no, well, I was just gonna say, I mean, part of that is Bitcoin has had, you know, 10 years of growth and it's had a good slow growth, you know? Um, so the network has had time, you know, to, to get to this level, but then that's part of the problem with a lot of new <laughs> blockchain projects is they want to scale instantly, infinitely. And you like the laws of thermodynamics are what they are. You can't do that. Um, <laughs> And, and and that just speaks more to how they it's just a money making scheme for them as to where you know like with with what Satoshi had in mind with what Bitcoin had in mind it was okay here is here is something you can own that was comes without anybody's permission but your own but your own you know you verifying the blockchain and whatever that's all the permission you need you don't need a paper from the government you don't need anything from the government and so in some ways like it's it's so much more than money even though that's really all I wanted to do is just be digital gold but it but in philosophy it is so much more. And nobody, none of these other blockchain projects even talk like that. Like they just don't care, you know? And, and, oh, it's a, I mean, it's funny, you know, I mean, the, the easiest argument for Bitcoin is read the white paper for Bitcoin, read the white paper for everybody else. Everybody else just sounds like they're part of the legacy system. Bitcoin sounds like, hey, let's get out of this shit. And I love that. Love that to death. Yeah. 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 Right, right there with you, man. Right, right, right there with you. And uh, I guess just the last thing I'll mention on this and we'll begin to, to kind of close out. But uh, a couple of days ago, um, I, uh, sure. I, I, I was looking my, we, we have a distillery family distillery. I, mean, I go, I make liquor is my, my not real day job is what I call it. And, um, <laughs> they, uh, I, I, I handle a lot of their email marketing stuff. And, uh, so I, I, and I, and, and their email and like one of the, one of the organizations they're subscribed to, um, was talking about like NFTs for spirits. So I was like, you've got to be effing kidding me. Oh. Um, like on one of these specialized like email lists. So I was like, okay, so, so NFTs are basically like, um, like the Facebook of crypto now. Um, like it's, it's just, it's yeah. and that's, that's, <laughs> That immediately from and the only thing I knew about him before that was obviously there's a lot of talk on you know on crypto Twitter Bitcoin Twitter, but uh, it basically yeah. just ba basically just like exchanging JPEG files online is kind of the the gist of it I guess I don't know um, <laughs> to to a certain yeah. extent so like I, I, I it just I don't know like we, we talk about all this stuff with Bitcoin like all these and then every, all of this other shit just seems silly and superfluous and not really worthwhile of, of time but again the few pro the, the projects that yeah. are worthwhile will rise to the top like library like we talked about Odyssey um, and and, and yep. like ones that actually have value will you know be there but a lot of this just shit just seems silly uh, you know silly distractionary nonsense but um, anyway man um, I Yep. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, um, I mean, two quick things on the NFTs. Uh, so actually my most, re as of we're recording this, my most recent episode uh, was about an hour and a half totally on NFTs um, and just ripping them to shreds. Uh, but that's also something, even if you did, even if there wasn't a great argument made for NFTs, counterparty, you know, on top of Bitcoin can do NFTs. There are people who sell NFTs that way. So again, like you don't even need anything else. You could just do it on, on Bitcoin. Fair. Why aren't more people doing NFTs on Bitcoin? Because it's not about NFTs being a good idea. It's about making a quick buck with someone else's bullshit blockchain. So anyway, just tossing that out. 
<laughs> very good awesome um so uh um yeah we've been we've been going for a little over an hour and i know you got a, a hard stop coming up um but uh i guess yeah. uh, any any sure. other, before i let you go any other uh i guess any other closing thoughts on fortifying the digital second realm that you may that you may not have uh, thought of when we were talking about it before um or i guess uh on bitcoin generally or, or any, anything else any closing thoughts yeah um i mean i, I ironically i guess i'll say that you know reining in your digital life is, is just so key right now. Like concentrate a lot more <laughs> on the physical, you know, I mean, there, there are, we've talked about some of the solutions around, you know, what you can do within the digital realm right now to try and resolve things. Um, I mean, there's interesting projects happening like mesh tastics T beam, you know, where it's just these little USB connectable devices that can send, you know, small amounts of data between each other or over such an amount of range. Um, I mean, maybe that's something we can talk about in the future because I'm still yeah. testing them out. Um, I mean, so, you know, th there's there's projects being worked on. There's projects that, I mean, and they're not just worked on, like they exist. You can hold them, you can buy them right now. And that that's important to me. Um, but really, I mean, something that, that's, that, that I've learned in the tech world over the past 10 years that I've been doing my own show um, is boy, you got to concentrate on the physical. Like, I love how you're saying, and, I, and I've and i listened to your episodes, you know, how much you're concentrating on health. I mean, I've always felt that one of the real tactics on being uh, invulnerable, you know, against, or being more, more uh, less vulnerable, you know, to coercion um, is, you know, like just being healthy, you know, mm -hmm. outlive the state. And I think that's possible. Like, like you, you know, if you concentrate on your health, especially on your mental health, because the digital realm, the, the tech world as it is, will drive you nuts. You know, I mean, spend five minutes on Twitter, you know, let, let's see how long you stay calm. You know what I mean? Right. I'm sure you understand that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, like, like really, yeah, I, I think concentrating on health as much as you can uh, is, is a, is a really key thing, even though, you know, here I am giving you tech solutions at the same time, like that, that's always, always number one. Don't expect tech to, to resolve any of that. And, I think it's it's the best thing that that anybody can do is just work on their mental physical health. Yeah, right on. Cheers, man. Cheers. Um, I I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. And and last thing before before I let you go, uh, let the listeners know uh, you know where to where to find your podcast and anything else you're working on that uh, that you like to plug. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you just want to head up to sovereigntech.com. That's S O V V is in Victor R Y N Tech T E C H dot com. Um. And, you know, again, we're, we've been going for 10 years strong and we plan on going for another 10. So <laughs> there, there's uh, and lots of projects in the works, of course, but the best place to find out about all of them is checking in with the podcast, uh, you know, at SovereignTech.com. For sure. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for uh, for your time today. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely have to get you back on. And it'll be a lot sooner this time. Maybe in a couple months, we'll we'll get some get some new scheduled and uh, some some projects or, or whatever. But yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk about that. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for your time today, man. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. No, it's an honor. Appreciate it, and and, and keep going, man. You, you're you're delivering great truth out there. Hey, thanks, man. Appreciate it. So, all right, guys, uh, there you have it. Brian Sovereign from the Sovereign Tech Podcast. Um, thanks again to him for coming on, and uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, before I let you guys go, the second installment in uh, Matthew Atechi's Brushfire Thriller series, uh, 2048, was released a few weeks back with uh, our book release live stream hosted live uh, on Jitsi. And uh, yeah, after an eight or month nine pro uh, eight or nine month process from start to finish, it's uh, great to have another terrific uh, piece of anarchist fiction out for your delectation. Uh, you can snag twenty forty eight uh, alone uh, by visiting libertyunderattack.com forward slash twenty forty eight, uh, or pick up the Brushfire bundle at libertyunderattack.com forward slash twenty forty eight bundle. Uh, just check the show notes or libertyunderattack.com uh, to find all of that. And uh, we also just recently uh, republished Carl Hess's Importance uh, Direct Action Focus book, uh, Community Technology. Uh, to pick that one up, uh, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Hess uh, or check out the website for a full extensive catalog. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. And uh, always remember, Vonu is yours for the making and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with, with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with, with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work.
you know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, you can't communicate without being monitored. It basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. Libertyunderattack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom. The second volume in the Brushfire Thriller series takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the War of Ideas took place. The creation of Second Realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished for the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty, until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the freedom cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren, still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been band nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC-encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the state zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They're up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the TRIO, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the TRIO pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire Bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Liberty Attack Publications, share your story, find your freedom. <laughs>